my presentation is just sort of updating us where we are at right now and the market's reaction and and you know basically the the rationale behind uh, uh, the companies we have uh, presenting later in terms of what they're offering so we'll talk about again everybody knows what's going on with the covid-19 pandemic just uh, go into a just flip through that pretty quick but more importantly the economic impacts of the policies to combat the virus and then we'll look into specific commodities and company impacts right now so basically everyone's got a puzzle that they do at home and that's what we're sitting at right now we've got a puzzle going we don't know what this is going to look like at the end we don't know if we got all the pieces and we're sitting right there with a lot of uncertainty and so we all know that this thing began in Wuhan. So it all began in the second largest economy and the number one consumer of commodities, China. And again, the big differences between what happened with the SARS uh, epidemic in uh, 2003, and importantly, that was more of an epidemic than a pandemic. You know, China wasn't as linked to the global economy, uh, but since that, uh, you know, uh, 15 years later, it is more linked with respect to tourism, travel, uh, its proportion of GDP, how it's linked with respect to exports. So now when China coughs, everybody sneezes. And so right now we're centered on the largest economy, really the focus right now is what's happening in the US. And so without a vaccine, and we don't know when we're gonna get one, the mitigating factors about this are pretty rudimentary, social distancing, we do self-isolation, quarantines, we wash our hands like anything. Face masks are now okay. Uh, chloroquine, I don't know anything about. Ingesting disinfectant, I don't recommend it. So the whole idea, again, uh, everyone's seen these curves, is about just flattening these curves to reduce the probability of fatalities. And that's basically the game we're playing. And this implies a big reduction in economic activity. And so these are 10 economies that represent about $60 trillion of GDP. In 2019, they averaged a growth about 2.8%, you know, and the forecast now, which is uh, always being adjusted, is around negative 4% for the for these same 10 economies. And so, you know, there's a pretty good chance, high probability of a recession, which is a GDP contraction for two consecutive quarters for uh, most of the major economies. We have fallen industrial production, which is uh, impacting a lot of the base metals. Unemployment is high. Obviously, incomes are, are getting reduced, fall in sales. The, the worry is that does this get more protracted and turn into a depression uh, with unemployment going skyrocketing to 25% and uh, a lot of deflation. So this is uh, from the US, uh, uh, the US Department of Labor. So we've seen over five weeks, 26 million jobs lost, about 16% of the workforce of the US. So that's basically eliminated all the job creation from September 2010. And that's been wiped out in just five weeks. And so uh, uh, the monetary response has been one, reducing the uh, reserve rate. To, uh, so during the global financial crisis, there was a higher uh, interest rate to reduce from. So you were sitting at over five and there was 175 basis points of cuts. Uh, that's raised back up. But uh, you know, when we started, because of the, uh, the uh, the China trade war, the U.S.-China trade war, uh, the monetary uh, um, policy was getting a little bit more easing because of the potential risk of these trade wars. And so we were already sitting at about one and a half percent. And in, in addition to that, we made another 150 basis points uh, reduction. And so we're sitting almost at zero. And so if we look at the expansionary policy, the balance sheet of the US, so the US balance sheet before the global financial crisis in 2008 was sitting at about 1 trillion. And it's grown to about four and a half trillion uh, about 2013, 2014, so about 350%. And it was falling slightly uh, in 2018 to 2019, but since we've risen just in the last few weeks, 44%, now we're at $6.5 trillion on the balance sheet. 
And if you look at the graphics, gold's relationship to the rising balance sheet is mixed. You know, sometimes it actually went up right after the global financial crisis, but that was probably more due to risk. And then when it was going down, uh, the balance sheet, gold was still going up. So, but the better relationship is the broad equity market. That seems to have a good uh, correlation between balance sheet expansion. And if you look, the US is not the only one with a significant stimulus package. I mean, this graphic represents about 16 countries, about 65 trillion in cumulative GDP. They've injected uh, uh, between them about $6 trillion of stimulus packages into their respective economies. On average, this translates to nine to 10% of their GDP. The UK and Japan gave the most of their GDP, about 20%. And the, one of the uh, smallest uh, uh, allocations was actually the Chinese stimulus package, which was uh, 5%. So if you want to see how the S&P uh, did, the S&P 500 as a broad uh, you know, proxy for the market during the global financial crisis and right now during the pandemic, you can see that there was, you know, you know depending on your time frame for the year, it looks a little bit more like a U-shaped with respect to the, uh, to the broad market recovery going from a 46% drop to a 65% rebound. We've already seen a significant drop of 34%. The question is, are we gonna see another one? And we've seen recently a rebound due to a lot of these expansionary policies that the market likes. So in terms of commodities, this is year to date of a number of commodities and other uh, factors I watch, uh, uh, whether it's uh, equity, uh, uh, ETFs, uh, uh, treasuries, uh, and uh, the dollar. And so you can see that the most important thing right here is the volatility. That's skyrocketed. And the slowdown in economic activity has impacted a lot of commodities, not just base metals. The, the biggest one is basically crude oil. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more. But the push for safe haven assets has helped gold and also treasuries. But the best performing commodity out of this list has basically been uranium uh, year to date. And to talk about the uncertainty in that volatility index spiking, if we look the volatility index previously was, you know, during the global financial crisis, got up to about 45. But and when gold rose to about $1,900, but now it's, uh, you know, the VIX has gotten up to 82, you know, not quite double what it was during the global financial crisis. And gold has only, you know, got up to, you know, it's got up to 1770, but nowhere near the 1900 it, it, it got to before. And this safe haven demand, if we look at the gold price uh, during 2008, during the global financial crisis and 2020, you can see that during the global financial crisis, gold dropped from about $1,000 to about 700, a 30% drop. Uh, whereas now we've seen a drop in gold price, but now we're seeing a big spike in gold price recently from a low of 1480 uh, around mid-March to uh, to about 1769. I mean, now it's come off a bit, but still that's a, that recovery was quicker. Uh, granted, it's probably gonna be volatile going forward. But importantly, the World Gold Council has pointed out in the first quarter, it had about 298 tons of uh, gold-backed ETF inflows, which pushed the global holdings to a record of 3,185 tons, which it's sitting at right now at the end of the quarter. In terms of gold with respect to uh, just returns in multiple currencies, and always a positive for gold if it's up in uh, multiple currencies and it's up in not only consuming nations uh, like India and uh, China, but um, also up in producing nations, uh, the biggest one being uh, the South African Rand. But the issue right now, according to the World Gold Council, is that the high prices in consuming nations is leading to a fall in the jewelry demand to record lows, but this is right now being offset by the record demand from it for investment. But if we look at all these uh, uh, price uh, returns of the US dollar was one of the weakest, it's still positive, but it was one of the weakest overall. So if we look at leverage and we're concerned ourselves with equities, um, if we look at the GDXJ, um, it's been very volatile. Uh, so from June, 2019, it's been outperforming gold. But when gold had the big dip 
uh, going into the middle of March, um, the GDX uh, J just basically collapsed. Uh, but this leverage is proxied in the, since middle of uh, March uh, to now. The you know gold price is up about 17 percent, while the DDXJ is up 70 percent. Uh, you know a leverage of about a four beta. But the base uh, uh, this uh, pandemic, the drop in industrial production and global ec economic activity has not been kind to base metals. So base metals had been declining the latter part of last year due to uh, the US-China uh, trade wars. And that's just continued into the uh, pandemic. As again, China is the biggest consumer. Um, and so uh, the demand for global uh, uh, commodities was already reducing before we got, uh, before the pandemic hit uh, uh, North America. We've seen a recent rebound uh, towards the end of March, but uh, I think going forward, it's gonna be highly volatile. So the other impact of the global pandemic is just on functioning like you did before. So gold companies have a harder time taking advantage of the higher gold prices because of these disruptions. And for base metal companies, part of their loss of production and lower prices is offset a little bit by these disruptions. But you could see that one of the things I pointed out earlier was uranium was one of the outperformers year to date. And one of the big reasons is the amount of disruptions so uh, it's got the highest amount of disruptions. The production at risk is about 12% and uh, you know, about 21 different uh, mines have been impacted. But uh, importantly, not only are these the mines that uh, you know, are, are marginal at, at low uranium prices, but also the, the lower cost mines are shutting down just because of the COVID-19 pandemic and national lockdowns, especially uh, in Kazakhstan. And so if we go to copper, um, the CRU, uh, the Commodity Research Unit, um, is, is estimating like about 600,000 tons of, or more of copper at risk due to the local shutdowns, especially in Peru, Mexico, uh, Cobre Panama shut down. Uh, some of these shutdowns are, are due to the copper price, but there's the potential for more disruptions due to the COVID pandemic as well, especially in Chile. Uh, you know, most of these copper only companies are in, uh, you know, they've got issues with their balance sheets and Cadelco, a state owned firm, uh, Chilean owned firm uh, is issuing another $800 million of bonds to shore up its balance sheet. And so uh, my big premise on copper remains that window of, of copper projects to fall into that 2023-5 window when um, the demand uh, far exceeds uh, uh, the potential production. Uh, you know, a lot of forecasts uh, assume that 100% of the uncommitted capital needs to be there for this, uh, uh, for e even for this to be balanced, which I doubt if this will happen. So, hence uh, the idea of exploration companies and prospect generators like Mondoro Capital that are focused in copper in Serbia, and, and also Trilogy Metals, which is developing the Arctic uh, um, polymetallic deposit in um, Alaska with, uh, with Cell 32. But the other issue that we've seen, and I pointed this out earlier, was a big drop in crude oil. And so crude oil went basically negative, which is, you know, um, amazing, uh, down to about $40 a barrel. And the, the big reason is um, world production kept going higher because of the uh, battle between Russia and Saudi Arabia in terms of output, uh, whereas the consumption dropped uh, and, and so this uh, led to a buildup of inventories and nobody wanted to take delivery of the May contract and that plunged the uh, price down of that contract. And so as a consequence of these low prices, you know, a big company like uh, Shell cut its dividend for the first time since World War II, it cut its dividend by about two thirds. And also there's this hedge fund that's pushing tech resource to basically divest itself of its uh, oil assets. And so uh, when we look at uh, oil, we also look at the gold to oil ratio. And if you could uh, look at that, you know, during 2000 to 2008, when gold uh, oil was peaking to about $145 per barrel, the ratio was only 10 times. But now since 2014, the average has been more like 26 times. Uh, and now recently it's reached a high of about 106. Now, how does that impact companies? Like if we take a miner like Barrick, a major producer, 
these companies are assuming 60 65 dollars wti in their uh, business plans and so if you take their 2019 consumption of 4 million barrels assume like a $30 per barrel price of savings potential is, uh, you know, it could be up to $25 an ounce for a company like that. So the other big thing about COVID-19, the pandemic is the reduction of activities. Not only are we isolated and uh, we can't go to work, but also exploration companies and development companies have a hard time doing their job. And so we're seeing a significant drop according to the S&P Global Market Intelligence of exploration activity. And so now leading up to the summer as uh, Trilogy Metals and also High Gold uh, can talk about in the Northern Hemisphere about their work activities going forward and how COVID-19 may impact them. And finally, I mean, in terms of financing activity, we saw a big reduction in March with respect to financing activity. The last two years in March saw about a billion dollars US of financing in 150 to 200 uh, transactions. Whereas in 2020, uh, in March, we saw about 250 million worth of transactions and maybe in about 125 just in May. Importantly, and uh, as a positive note, in April, we saw about 316 million Canadian of transactions by just four companies. These are four development stage uh, precious metal focused uh, companies that have good backing and they managed to raise the money. So it's sort of saying that quality still can find a way to access capital during these times. So as I finish my uh, uh, talk, I mean, basically, we're going to get somewhere sometime and maybe that uh, uh, that puzzle looks exactly like we thought it was going to look or it might look a lot different. But all we know right now is the pandemic is clearly focused on the Americas and, and the US. The global GDP forecasts have fallen significant and we could be in a recession and some people could get into a depression. The unemployment rates are skyrocketing uh, as we've seen from the US. Uh, but a way to get around that is uh, expanding the monetary policies, which they've done with uh, lower interest rates and um, significant stimulus packages. Gold has rebounded from its initial shock and equities have followed. Negatively impacted have been the base metals, but mining disruptions have helped offset some of that uh, drop in demand. Uranium remains the best performing commodity to date due to a large part due to the disruptions. Uh, copper mining disruptions, again, offset somewhat fall in demand, but for me, the big deal is uh, deficits going forward into 23, 25 because of lack of quality projects. Fall in oil prices helps miners, and the drop in exploration activity might reduce uh, uh, you know, people's uh, companies' abilities to deliver catalysts. And finally, financing's mixed, but focus on quality precious metal plays are still attracting financing. <laughs>